Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Paradoxes series, where I show you how to understand paradoxical quantum thought experiments by coding them as quantum circuits using Qiskit. Today I'll be talking about... Wow, it actually worked! What? You're... You're me? How is this possible? Hi Maria! Yes, I am you, from the future. A few minutes ago, I was stood where you are, filming this video, and my future self came to see me. She told me about this time machine, and I stepped in. And when I came out of the time machine, I was five minutes into the past. Wow! That's amazing! But if that's true, surely we can cause some kind of paradox to happen. Like the grandfather paradox, where someone goes to the past and kills their own grandfather. Or what if you killed me right now, then I would never go into the time machine in the first place? Or what if I take this mug and then cause a contradiction with the fact that you don't have a mug? Or what if I run off? You won't. I said all the exact things you are saying and here I am. The grandfather paradox has actually been solved in quantum mechanics by David Deutsch in 1991 using a consistency condition which imposes that a system coming out of a time machine must be identical to the one that went in. This condition means that you won't take that mug when you go in. It holds whether the system in the time loop is a qubit or a person like me and you. This still seems pretty weird. Surely something must go wrong if these time loops really exist. Well, yeah, it does cause some very weird things to happen. For example, you can violate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle by simultaneously measuring a quantum state in the X basis and the Z basis. And you can violate the no cloning theorem. You can clone as many quantum states as you like. And you can store unbounded amounts of classical information like the complete works of Shakespeare or your entire music collection in a single qubit. And you can break the security of quantum cryptographic protocols like BB84. Okay, I get the point. I think the best way to really understand these ideas is to do some Qiskit simulations of the crazy things that you could do with qubits with access to a time loop. That's a great idea. Our time is up though. It's your turn to go into the time machine. I'll stay here and show our audience how to simulate access to time loops in Qiskit. You need to go and tell your past self everything that I just told you. But I, I want to start coding. You'll have your chance soon. Now you really need to go so we don't cause any real time travel paradoxes. Well, I am curious to experience how this time machine works. Fine, I'll go in. See you on the other side, I guess. Bye, Maria. Bye, Maria. Well, that was the strangest interaction of my life. Let's try and make sense of time loops. A good place to start is to express the events that just took place where I met my past self using a quantum circuit. Here I'm going to be using reduced density matrices to describe the states of quantum systems. If you're not familiar with the formalism of reduced density matrices, I recommend reading the section on density matrices on the IBM Quantum Learning Platform before continuing with this video. For a full introduction to quantum circuits, look at the Basics of Quantum Information course. These are linked in the video description. Now, I'm going to model my two selves, each as quantum systems. If you want to find out more about the validity of treating macroscopic observers as quantum systems, take a look at my videos on Schrodinger's cat and Wigner's friend. Here I'm going to assume that quantum theory is universal and we can describe any system as a quantum state. Here is the overall circuit. Let's say that my original self that started the video was in the state psi in, represented by this state vector. Then my future self came out of the time machine. I will describe its state by the density matrix rho CTC, where CTC stands for closed time-like curve, 
which is the technical term for time loops in physics. Next, my two selves interacted. Since they are quantum systems, they must interact via a unitary interaction, which I've labelled U prime. After that, my original self enters the time machine. To avoid paradoxes, I must enter the time machine in the same state that I leave the time machine. So my state as I enter the time machine must also be rho CTC. My other self stayed and continued with the video and I have labelled her final state as rho out. It is helpful to rewrite this circuit in an equivalent form. Let's add a swap gate between my two selves before the end of the circuit. This is a valid unitary gate which swaps the state of two systems. Then I can write my circuit using a unitary u, which is the same as u prime, but with a swap gate at the end. Now the first quantum system begins in psi in and comes out in rho out after the unitary u. And the second quantum system comes out of the time machine in the state rho ctc and then goes back into the time machine in the state rho ctc after the unitary u. So in our rewritten circuit, the consistency condition for avoiding grandfather paradoxes is that the qubit that goes into the time loop has to be in the same state as the qubit that comes out of the time loop. Mathematically, the reduced state of the system that goes into the time loop, rho ctc, must be equal to the state we get when we let the input state psi in and the input state rho ctc interact via the unitary u and then trace out the first system. So the reduced state of the second system stays as rho ctc. Now, famously, quantum mechanics is linear. The consistency condition introduces non-linearity because the consistent state imposed on the qubit in the time loop depends on the state of the qubit it interacted with. This non-linearity makes lots of strange things happen that can't happen in standard quantum mechanics without time loops, which I'll now show you using Qiskit. Unfortunately, we don't currently have access to time loops or even know if they can really exist. My interaction with my past self earlier was actually made by filming two separate clips and editing them on top of each other and was pre-prepared to make the interaction self-consistent according to the consistency condition. Similarly, when coding this as a quantum circuit, we're going to artificially simulate the non-linearity of having access to a time loop. For our first trick with closed timelike curves, I'll show you how they let us distinguish quantum states zero and minus with a single measurement. So let's start coding. Here is the quantum circuit we need to create. Here we have a system qubit which can be in the zero or minus state. Then we have our time loop qubit, which must be in the same state at the beginning and end of the circuit. The swap and controlled Hadamard are needed for the circuit to be able to distinguish the zero and minus states. So in my code, I'll first ask the user for the input of zero to prepare the zero state and minus to prepare the minus state. If the user inputs zero, then my code leaves the system qubit as a zero and the time loop qubit as a zero, which is the state needed to make the time loops qubit's input and output states the same according to the consistency condition. Now, if the user inputs minus, then my code applies a Hadamard and Z to the system qubit to prepare it in the minus state and an X gate to the time loop qubit to prepare it in the one state, which is the state needed to satisfy the consistency condition when the input is minus. I have artificially introduced the non-linearity into the quantum circuit by making the preparation of the time loop qubit depend on the input state, which in a real time loop would automatically be self-consistent. So, Let's run this for an input of zero and an input of minus. 
when we run it for an input of zero, we see that we always get an outcome of zero. And if we run it for an input of minus, then we always get an outcome of one. So the time loop allows us to perfectly distinguish the zero state from the minus state, even just with a single measurement. Using the same idea, we can create a quantum circuit that can distinguish between the four states zero, one, plus and minus in a single shot. This means that someone with access to a time loop could cheat the BB84 protocol, which is meant to provide foolproof way of protecting information from eavesdroppers using quantum cryptography. The protocol relies on the ability to check if someone intercepted a message, but with a time loop, the eavesdropper could intercept the message, measure its state, and then prepare exactly the same one, covering their tracks. So this time we have our system qubit in either the zero, one, plus or minus state, and an extra qubit beginning in the zero state, and then two qubits in our time loop that need to end up in the same state. Then we have these swaps and four control gates, to make the circuit work for distinguishing the four states. So let's try out the circuit. When we run it with an input of zero, so it's the circuit, then we run it and we get zero, zero. If we run it with an input of one, we get one, zero. If we run it with an input of plus, then we get zero, one. And if we do an input of minus, then we get one, one. So we can distinguish any of the four possible input states with a single measurement. Now from an information theory perspective, we achieve something extremely surprising if we could really implement this circuit we gain two bits of classical information from measuring a single input qubit. Even though a qubit can normally only store one bit of information. Even worse, we could construct a similar circuit to distinguish between any number of non-orthogonal states. This means that we could store an unbounded amount of classical information in a single qubit. You could try making this circuit yourself or even one that violates the no cloning theorem. All of the code that I've used in this video is in the Jupyter notebook linked in the description. Access to time loops makes us much more powerful than if we just had access to a universal quantum computer. Exactly how powerful was worked out by quantum scientists, Scott Aronson and John Watrous in 2008. The power of computers is defined by complexity classes. Aronson and Watrous showed that the complexity class for a computer with access to time loops is p-space, which is all problems solvable by a conventional computer using a polynomial amount of memory, though they may still require exponential time. p-space is a huge space, much bigger than the complexity class of quantum computers without time loops. Strangely, given access to time loops, the complexity classes of classical and quantum computers become the same. While the powerful computational powers of time loops makes their existence surprising and counterintuitive, it does not rule them out. However, some problems remain in making time loops fully consistent with the laws of physics. One is the knowledge paradox. Earlier in the video, I explained how time loops work to my past self. Then armed with this knowledge, my past self went through the time machine and explained time loops to another past version of me. There is no logical inconsistency here, but where did my knowledge about time loops come from? I was taught about time loops from my past self and there's no mechanism by which that knowledge could have been created. Another problem is with locality. Einstein proposed a criterion for locality of quantum theory, which says that one system can only be affected by another system if they directly interact. Even though some accounts of entanglement make it appear that measuring one quantum system instantaneously affects the other, 
there is a local formulation of quantum theory explained in my previous videos on the EPR paradox and quantum teleportation. Einstein's locality is important for making quantum theory consistent with gravity. With time loops, Einstein's principle of locality is violated. Observables of a qubit going into a time loop could in principle be different from those coming out of the time loop, even though their density matrices are the same, violating Einstein's locality. Some attempts have been made to restore locality by modifying quantum theory, but the challenge remains to ensuring that there are no time travel paradoxes emerging in these alternative formulations. I think these unsolved problems with time loops might mean that they are fundamentally incompatible with our universe. I disagree. The idea of efficiently factorising large numbers seemed impossible before the discovery of quantum computing and Shor's algorithm. Perhaps one day, the discovery that time loops are possible will bring another revolution in computing. Bye for now!